We have some time for clarifications. Mr. Dowell, David. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for, for that speech. I have a clarification which links to a question that I posed um, as a, a um, oral PQ previously. Minister talked about going beyond sports and about involving the community a lot more in the sports hub, and that's really heartening. I'd like to ask, uh, Minister, if there's any consideration being given to perhaps having one of the, if not the biggest community event of the year, which is the National Day Parade, um, held at the uh, National Stadium of the Sports Hub. I had the privilege of actually marching in the PCF contingent for the only parade NDP held at a Sports Hub since I think it was in 2016. And I can say it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. So, Minister, in the past, as you know, one year was held in National Stadium, Old National Stadium, one year was held in the Padang. Are there plans to perhaps commit to a, a more regular schedule of having the parade held at the, uh, the, the stadium, at the sports hub, and perhaps even involving the Kalang Alive area in a, in a month of celebration, say across the entire month of August, for example, that, that leads into uh, a meaningful celebration uh, at, at the NDP. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. David. I'm glad you enjoyed marching in the PCF contingent. <laughs> I, t I take it you were leading the contingent. Yes, yes I was. Sir. We will certainly be open to it. I think what this taking back of the ownership and management of Sports Hub is designed to do is to give us more flexibility and the, abil the ability to not less cost, not let costs, which was otherwise a serious prohibitive factor, constrain the organisation of events like the NDP at Sports Hub. At the same time, we also want to be circumspect about having it there every year or even every other year because there is a five to seven month lead time before and after where much of the facilities will have to be decked up for rehearsals and can't be used. So you've got to think about it in terms of the programming that we want to do for the Sports Hub, the availability and the options around how to organise the NDP at the Sports Hub. But certainly, Mr David can be assured that this will be a consideration and at the very least, the Sports Hub will be open for MINDEF to consider hosting the NDP there. Mr Sia Yao Chen. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his comprehensive update on the decision to take back ownership and management of the Sports Hub and also the plans uh, to unlock the Sports Hub's full potential for Singapore and Singaporeans. Um, I am very glad to hear about the move and um, I have a clarification for Minister about the leadership of the Sports Hub going forward. Uh, starting with the CEO. And um, I think we will need a CEO going forward who is able to understand the vision, execute on the vision, and really bring it to life, bring it alive. Uh, and importantly, a, a CEO who's able to build a leadership team to help him or her to achieve all of this. So can the minister give some update about um, what is the selection process that we can expect maybe in the months ahead and what are some of the principles or some of the qualities that um, uh, we will be looking for in a CEO to lead the sports hub in its next chapter? Thank you. Sir, I thank Mr. Sia for his support of this takeover and the project that, we, that I've laid out before members over the last 45 minutes or so. Uh, we are considering various options for the CE of the Sports Hub, and I don't want to go into specifics at this point in time, but I agree with Mr. Sia that we do have to look out for qualities such as an ability to integrate with the rest of Kalang Alive. That's, after all, one of the fundamental raison d'etre behind why we're doing this. That person must have strong organisational skills because there are several components that come together. That's not just sports, but also lifestyle, entertainment. We've got to deal with the local uh, ecosystem, you've got to have an eye for who our best international private sector partners might be, layers with them externally, bringing international events into Singapore. And there must most importantly also be a, a clear eye on being able to use the sports hub assets to be able to drive our sporting, social and lifestyle outcomes. And those are the key qualities that we will look out for for the leadership of Sports Hub. 
Mr. Sito Yipin. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm heartened to hear from Minister that uh, once government takes over the sports hubs management, we are going to do a lot more things for a lot more Singaporeans. But, sir, that will also mean that we need a lot, <clears throat> that we need a lot more resources. Uh, bearing in mind that the MCCY budget is always amongst the smallest in every budget, uh, I'd like to ask the Minister whether he can go to the Finance Minister and ask for more funding. Because, sir, especially when we celebrate National Day next week, the lion must roar. The, sir, the DPM and the Finance Minister is grinning at me. From behind He's wearing a mask. A mask. <laughs> <laughs> um, sir, I think that's a good question. We will, obviously, before we, we embark on this, we have satisfied ourselves that at least the baseline of what we say we, are, we want to achieve, we have enough resources to drive towards. But obviously, the details as to what an enhanced budget might look like is something we have to discuss closely. And you've got to bear in mind our current fiscal constraints and position as well. Mr. Gerald Yam. Sir, could, could the government not have tapped on international private sector experience using the procurement model? Uh, secondly, how would uh, Sport SG bring in more marquee events when, SH, when SHPL, with all its international experience, could not? And lastly, will the Sports Hub and Kalang Alai Precinct be used to host all national sports competitions and national schools games? And can Sport SG make greater efforts to market such events to a wider audience? This will inspire our young athletes to push themselves harder, increase the public attendance at such competitions, and also free up other community sports facilities to the general public. These uh, facilities, as Minister might well be aware, tend to be block booked by the national sports associations for competitions and training to the consternation of some members of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giam. On your first point, yes, it's, it would have been possible for third parties, private sector partners and so on to work with the procurement model. Uh, indeed, that's, that is the case in many procurement models. But the reasons I outlined earlier carefully about the unique nature of this project, the fact that it was innovative, cutting edge, and we were moving into an area which, frankly, in Singapore, there was at that time not much experience, mm -hmm. and also a question of risk allocation, having a PPP project in the way I've described puts this partner in the context of having some skin in the game and to ensure that every delay, every failure of availability, in other words, when the stadium or the facility is not available because of a defect or a problem with the facility, that is a responsibility they bear. If you went to a third party and you bought those services and you provided for that, then the government will bear the risk of that. Quite apart from that, the the government will also have had to bear the risk and the obligation, financial obligation, of incurring the capex from the start. So having regard to what I've said earlier, I think I've explained why, whilst we could have, in the way Mr. Giam has put it, we chose not to do so in the procurement model, but to do it by way of a PPP. Uh, on your last question, uh, whether we want to host all national school games and all other community games there because there is a I think Mr. Kiam puts it as uh, facilities are block booked and unavailable. It's, uh, I think we have to be clear. The sports hub obviously is a top class infrastructure and you can't conflate that with training and you know, more local domestic events for which we have many of the active SG facilities available in the stadium and other, other facilities around the island. And I think we've got to make sure that the relevant level of facility is used to host and cater for the relevant level of sporting activity. Yes, I did say we, would, we do want some national school games to be there, the finals or key moments, uh, but we can't turn the sports hub into a place where every school event is being held there. I think that would be difficult. Um, may, can Mr. Giam please repeat his second question on uh, Sport SG? Uh, my second question was, um, how will Sport SG be able to bring in more marquee events when SHPL, with all its international expertise, okay. was not able to? Well, first of all, that's been done. Uh, we have had some experience, as I mentioned earlier. We've built up our expertise over the years. We also work with uh, developed partners in the private sector today. So I mentioned Unusual, Live Nation being here, AEG, 
and so on, located in Singapore, having a vested interest in making sure that they bring these products into Singapore. So it's not just about Sport SG, but as I said, the maturity and the development of the entire ecosystem in Singapore. Uh, your other point, I think, presupposes that when PPP partner uh, SHPL did not bring marquee events into Singapore, it's because they were unable to do so. Part of the reason is because the cost structure of the project made it disincentivize them from doing so on a free basis, on a, on a freely available basis, because the cost structure meant that they would have to bear the risk of uh, there, for example, not being a good turnout or good take up of the ticket sales for such events, then the loss would be borne by them. So there, there were a number of structural problems with the current arrangement, which made it harder, not impossible, but harder for SHPL to have done so. Mr. Lim Biao Chuan. So I want to someone thank the minister for sharing with us the plans for Kalang Life plans. I'm very excited to hear about it, especially since the bulk of it falls within my constituency. Uh, but Sir MPs uh, in this House need to hold the government accountable for ministers, uh, ministry's expenditure. So Minister explained that the costs of um, taking over the SHPLs or taking over the Sports Hub is about $2.3 billion, and which is about the same price as what the government would have to pay from 2014 to 2035. May I ask the Minister, what about revenue from uh, sports or entertainment events that uh, SHPL would have uh, carried out during this term between 2014 to 2035? Does the government take a share in any of this um, revenue taken from sports or entertainment events? For example, I think Liverpool played recently at Sports Hub. Uh, did the government take a share in any of these uh, major events? Because if they do, then we also need to balance uh, how much it will, we will lose in terms of lost revenue in taking over the Sports Hub. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lim. The project agreement provides for a waterfall formula by which such costs would be apportioned, how payments would be apportioned and the priorities by which they meet the costs. And there is a formula which cascades down the uh, takings from these events and uh, they are then put into a fund and uh, at some, in some cases shared with the government. So there's a formula for that. The cost of running is high and so in most cases there's not much that comes down to a level which allows the government to share. And that itself is also one of the considerations behind this decision because if we were to take on board the entire project and run and manage it ourselves, as I mentioned earlier, then we would avail ourselves entirely of the upsides of any of these uh, projects. Of course, uh, you know, these are things which we shouldn't automatically assume that just because someone like Liverpool comes here that there will automatically be a tremendous upside because you've got to weigh up these com commercial considerations. But the point is, once we take back ownership of this, the structure allows us to then directly manage it. We will assess the risk, and if it's something we can get into, then the commercial revenue and the upsides can be taken by the government in this case. So there is a, currently there is a, a formula that prescribes the usage and the allocation of these uh, takings. Uh, after we terminate it and we do it on our own, then all of this will be within Sport SG and within the government to control. Mr. Leong Man Wai. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Please allow me to have one, two minutes of preamble before well, I ask my questions, okay? Perhaps I can restrict you to half a minute, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, there's been a lot of uh, aspirational uh, delivery uh, throughout this uh, session. I must also share my experience that first I support the governments taking over, taking back the sports hub. We are all very attached to the old national stadium. Ministers past and present have participated in the opening of the old national stadium together with me in 1973. So we are very attached to the old national stadium. We don't know why the sports hub was given to a private consortium. Okay. 
So, and secondly, throughout the discussion we have today, no one asked the question, is the $1.5 billion compensation or termination cost given to the private consortium fair or not? Of course, then we have to go into a lot of details of financial calculations or all that, but we still need to debate about that. But so far, no question has been raised. So let me ask two questions. The fact remains that why the decision was made at the beginning. Mr. Leong, please ask your questions. Yes, my, my, my question is... fair to the members who are after you also asking one, also wanting to ask clarifications. Okay. So please keep it short. I'll give you the leeway, but please keep it short. Yeah, my first question is, why was the decision made in the first place when it is quite possible that we can run on the procurement uh, uh, model? First question. Second question is, looking at the financial numbers, and bear with me a little while on that, basically, SHPL seems to have failed in its job, failed in the expectations that we have on them. Of course, when we ask international companies to come in, I'm in business for many years, I know. When I use the international partners, we expect them to bring in the marquee events. So if they didn't, didn't bring in the marquee events, they fail in their job. So why, for example, in the compensation formula, we pay for the $1.2 billion, which I presume is the outstanding bank loan. Mr. Leong, I've been listening to you quite carefully. You've asked your first question quite succinctly. Yes. I invite you to ask your second and final question now. My second question succinctly. is, is it, is it fair for, the, uh, for, for us to pay $1.5 billion to SHPL? Thank and you, I Mr. have to elaborate, right? Thank you, Mr. Leong. Yeah. Uh, we so okay, let, the... I, I let the minister elaborate first then. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Leong. I, I think I spent the better part of the last 45 minutes uh, precisely doing that, uh, elaborating at some length, because I think Mr. Leong did ask that question about why choose the PPP model. And I thought I explained in some detail why we considered the procurement model but was not appropriate, why we wanted to put the risk sharing allocation mechanism to work so that our partners would have skin in the game, that they would bear the risks as well, that there will be financial and market discipline in the way we structured the arrangement. I, I think all of this Mr. Leong would understand very well. So in the first place, why we went into it, why we chose this model, I think I've explained that in some detail. Then the question is whether it is fair. This is a termination sum that is based on a formula that's in the PPP, so it's the defined formula. Uh, the majority of this cost is the capex, as I explained. And this is a capex that we would have had to bear had we undertaken the procurement model anyway. So to give Mr. Leong an example, if we had taken the procurement model, we would have had to raise the entire cost of the construction up front and paid it by around 2010, which is when the project started, even before it became ready. So a full commitment of the sum, 2010. And over the years, we would have had to pay at least two large, uh, make two large payments every year. One, to service the loan that we would have, been, would have taken, or at least to account for the interest for that loan. And second, a commitment to an income stream that will allow the project to run, operate, maintain, keep a sinking fund for life cycle costs, and so on. And when we pay every year the 193 million towards SHPL, that's what those sums are for. It goes towards, as I explained earlier, for SHPL to meet their loan obligations and to meet their expenses for operations, maintenance, life cycle, and so on. So instead of paying the sum up front, what we did was we asked SHPL to come in. You've heard me explain earlier, so I won't go into it. And they bear the risk and they bear the cost. And once it is ready, and only when it is ready, we then make the payments each year to SHPL. So on that basis, when we take over, these are costs that we would have had to bear anyway, at least for this portion. The rest of it, as I said, is an open market valuation because they are the current owners of the, of the asset. And then there are some items like deductions, more minor items, how we deal with the debt reserve account and so on, other adjustments, but those are all minor. So 
in that regard, I've set out the parameters of the payment, the formula by which this is done, and why I believe this is a fair assumption. I'll come back to you, Mr. Leong. But no, Ms. Herting Room. Deputy Speaker, sir. No, it's a continuation. Uh, no, I'll come Minister back. hasn't answered my question. I think there's a point of order, Mr. Leong. We have to give people a chance in the House to ask the clarifications. The next person the Chair is calling is Ms. Herting Room. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the question that I asked um, the Minister previously. I think I'm not sure whether it was answered. It was whether there will be a review to be held to look in the circumstances that basically led to this early termination of the PPP project. Uh, this is really very much in the spirit of learning, you know, um, taking up learning points to be applied uh, to similar projects in the future, whether it is for uh, you know, sports and events, uh, you know, vibrant sports and events seen in Singapore, or you know, just uh, in particular whether you know, PPP projects, you know, whether in terms of our negotiation and structuring or usage even of the PPP projects in the future, uh, whether or not there's anything to be learned from this because, you know, yes, you know, uh, the minister has described that, you know, some parts of the project appear to have been successful, I mean, uh, 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 assessed to be su uh, successful, but, you know, obviously other parts have fallen short. So I'm just wondering in terms of the learning points, you know, making sure that uh, similar mis uh, any mistakes are not being repeated in the future, whether this is something that uh, is going to be taken and whether this uh, review and the results would be uh, shared with the public. Thank you. So I thank Ms. Her for that question. I, in terms of doing a review, actually what had been done in leading up to this decision was a very thorough review already. Uh, and that review went into aspects such as where they performed well, where they didn't perform so well, uh, looking at the internal capabilities within SportSG, whether we could muster up enough resources to do what they are doing, uh, the extent to which we feel we can commit to this, doing this on an international market basis, the, kind of partners that we might have in Singapore. Uh, and everything I mentioned in my speech earlier, I think are all factors that we took into account as we reached this decision. So that review actually has been done. And that's why we are confident and capable of coming to Parliament and explaining this to members and embarking on this termination. But to Ms. Her's point about whether all of these learning points would become something that we pick, take on board, obviously yes. With each PPP project we do, and indeed from the government, with each project that we do, large or small, there's always a continual learning point. We look back, we reflect, and we think about what could have gone better and take all those learning points into play and as we embark on new projects. I just want to emphasize that in this project, it is somewhat unique and different as well for the reasons I've set out earlier. And also because, as I said, this is a multi-year project over two decades for which at different junctures in this project, there are different objectives. And that's why the agreement is structured in this way, to put financial discipline uh, to put technical expertise at the forefront at the start of the project, but along the way to give us the ability to step in to manage when we felt that we were able to do so. And that's exactly how this project was done. But obviously these are learning points that we will take on board, and in subsequent projects, whether it's PPP or otherwise, they will feature in the thinking as we embark on this with third parties. Mr. Shahrul Taha. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister, for your comprehensive statement. I believe many sportsmen and women and uh, athletes in our national schools hear with excitement on the vision on the integrated sports prison. You mentioned that sports such as football, tennis, and track and field would have world-class facilities at the new sports prison. Is that least exhaustive? How do we create equal opportunity for other sports such as floorball, netball, uh, and even boxing to benefit from this vision and investment in our sporting future. And I say this because some in the fraternity, in the netball fraternity, is worried that they've got to move out of their Kalang Netball Centre, a much beloved location and facilities for netball. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ta. We, we obviously, uh, it's not an exhaustive list, uh, and um, there are various other plans in the pipeline. But I mention these because you do need something specialised to, you know, you need a specialised facility to play tennis. Uh, whereas if you have a hall that has a big space, it can be reconfigured for various purposes. As you know, the indoor stadium can be reconfigured for basketball. Floorball has taken place there in the OCBC arena. We can also reconfigure it to uh, deal with netball competitions as well. So there, there's a number of options when you have these spaces. Whereas for cycling, for 
football, for tennis, and some others, you will need a specialised facility to play that sport. Having said that, uh, the, um, your point about netball, I understand that they're moving out because this all that area is part of the area that I think from memory will be developed into the youth hub in time to come. Uh, netball, we have been in touch with them and will ensure that they will have a place that they were comfortable with and that they will be able to continue training and take care of the national players and their training needs as well. Okay, I see two hands. Uh, we'll have Mr. Dongman Wai and we'll end with Mr. Pritam Singh. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. But actually, I, I'm, I, have to, I, have been, I have to be given the right to ask because the minister didn't answer the question. Uh, I'm giving you the, yeah. the ability okay, to thanks, ask, thank but you. not to elaborate yeah, yeah, okay. in your speech. I, I ask a question. Huh? I'll ask a question. Um, minister, can I know um, why the government is so generous to pay $193.7 a year to the private consortium when you just mentioned also that the operating cost that after we take over will be about 68 million. I, I think it's not two points. One is not about being generous. This is what the contract says. And the contractual agreement provides for the way in which the sums are calculated. And secondly, Mr. Leong may not have heard me, uh, but the 193 million is not just the operation and maintenance. It is for debt service as well. And that, I think, is the from my memory, is the single largest portion of the 193 million goes towards debt service. Okay. Uh, speak, uh, Deputy Speaker, can I ask? Because what, question, one yeah. more question, yes. and then we'll go to the leader so, of the opposition. Minister, can I ask? Can I ask the minister what is the debt servicing amount inside the 193.7 million dollars? The debt servicing amount, uh, by to my memory, is about 65 percent of the 193 million. Right. Mr. Pritam Singh. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, have a, we haven't got, in, got to the bottom of the thing. Well, if you need to, you can file a specific parliamentary question. But to be fair to the members, this but is a topical issue. But what is the point of issue. having the, the debate without getting to the bottom of the thing? Having all kind of questions. Well, we must get to the bottom of the issue. Uh, Mr. Leong. I'm asking, and I don't think that that's a servicing... point of order, Mr. Leong. I've been very fair to you, and the chair has called Mr. Pritam Singh. But before that, I think the leader of the House would like to have a word. So I invite you to take your seat, Mr. Leong. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Deputy Speaker, on a point of order, what the standing orders require is for a minister to answer a question that is put. In this case, Mr. Leong had put a couple of questions. Mr. Edwin Tong had answered the questions. I think the fact that Mr. Leong doesn't understand the answer doesn't mean that the question has not been answered. Mr. Pritam Singh. Deputy Speaker, point of order, please. Can I answer the leader? Because the leader is accusing me of not understanding certain things. Uh, Mr. Leong, I invite you to ask parliamentary questions, which any member is capable of doing, if you think that your answers have not, your questions have not been suitably answered by Minister Edwin Tong. But now, not only my questions have not been suitably answered, but the leader is accusing me of something. I. He not I, sure. I'm not sure she's accusing you or the leader of the House is accusing, accusing you. She's accusing me that I don't no. understand the financials behind the, Mr. Dong, the questions that I'm asking. I'm going to say this as a, as a final position to you. Uh, the chair has been very fair. I think you've spoken on this issue three or four times in this debate alone. Um, and I ask you to give way to the, to the member who I have just called, Mr. Pritam Singh. Mr. Singh. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Just one question for the Minister. Um, in 2014, I asked a parliamentary question with regard to uh, non-performance uh, by SHPL. This was on the back of um, the uh, Malaysia, uh, I beg your pardon, the Brazil-Japan football game, and there were concerns about pitch quality and so forth. And then Minister MCCY confirmed that there was a provision for uh, deductions in the availability payment in the event of non-performance or non-availability for use. Can I just confirm from 2014 to date, uh, how much has the government uh, maybe of liquidated damages of what, whatever the, the, the clause in the PPP contract states, has the government um, uh, charged mm. uh, uh, S, uh, S, uh, SHPL for non-performance? Thank you. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, subject to checking this, I, and I'm just answering Mr. Singh based on memory, I believe the figure is around the order of 44 million for defects, rectification, non-availability payments and so on. But as I said, I'll check the precise mm -hmm. figure since he's asking for something from 2014 until I take it until at this point in time.